Hey, thanks for watching. Before we start today's episode, I wanna talk about our sponsor for today, Helix Sleep. As some of you may know, Helix has been a continued supporter of the show for quite some time. Well, I wanted to give you guys an update and let you know that I still actively use my Helix Sleep mattress. My sleep has genuinely improved from the first time we've talked about them. I've had a mattress now for about five months and I absolutely love it. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses to fit your needs and conveniently ship right to your front door. When you visit their website, what you need to take is a sleep quiz that they made and they'll match your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. I personally like a firm or medium mattress and based on my results, Helix matched me with their Helix Plus mattress. The best part about all of this is that Helix delivers your mattress right to your front door for free. It all comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up even by yourself. If it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried yet, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial guarantee. So you have more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a complete full refund. So if you wanna try out Helix today to see if you like their beds like I do, you can click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash the completionist. Again, helixsleep.com slash the completionist and get up to $200 off your Helix mattress. Thank you for watching. Now on with the show. In 1990, Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo's most enduring figure, and Yuji Horii, father of the JRPG, sat down for an interview with Famicom Magazine. Both developers are superstars in their own field, but they also have massive respect for each other. The interview is interesting, with both developers very openly saying what they love about the other's projects, with Horii even expressing a wish to write for a Zelda game one day. But what stood out to me was Miyamoto's perfect explanation of what makes Dragon Quest, especially the first two games, so special. Miyamoto says, In the Dragon Quest 1 and 2 era, I think everyone was looking for a way to make a game feel like a real adventure, despite only having numbers and stats to deal with. Hori is pleased with this implication that his games achieved this feeling, and explains how Dragon Quest games are designed to stimulate the player's imagination. Dragon Quest 2, despite being an imperfect attempt to expand the scope of JRPGs in general, is a perfect encapsulation of this philosophy. Nothing else compares to the feeling of getting drawn into a JRPG. I love knowing exactly what I'm in for. Turn-based battles, party and equipment management, a gradual increase in stats and power, exploring a big world for key items, and approximately one million random encounters. Minus one or two. I'm Gerard the Completionist, and I don't just beat the games, I complete them. I completed and really loved Dragon Quest 1. And now that 3 has an absolutely gorgeous HD 2D remake announced, I figure now it's time to knock out Dragon Quest 2. This game is like a progenitor to open world non-linear JRPGs. It may not be the most popular entry, but it introduces some of the best ideas in the franchise. And honestly, the Switch port is currently the best way to play Dragon Quest 2. So with that said, let's get to it. Yes! a lot of what makes Dragon Quest so iconic in my original Dragon Quest 1 episode. And if you missed that, take 16 minutes and 30 seconds roughly to check out that and then come right back. It's important to understand that there are action RPGs, Western RPGs, and JRPGs. And Dragon Quest is still the reason these exist to this day. Dragon Quest is known for being the original JRPG. The game established a genre with its turn-based combat and experience points-based leveling system. The sequel's development was a natural next step and further defined what a JRPG could be through a ton of trial and error. Dragon Quest creator slash lead designer Yuji Horii and game director Koichi Nakamura started planning Dragon Quest II as soon as they were able to. It's said that Horii began planning the sequel a month before the first game was even out, but that didn't mean that Dragon Quest II was released immediately after the first game. Dragon Quest I was released in Japan in the summer of 1986, and Dragon Quest II 
2 was released early in 1987. Now that is a fast turnaround. But publisher Enix originally wanted Dragon Quest 2 out even sooner, so what caused the delay? As it turns out, ambition was a major factor. Yuji Horii and his team weren't able to put all of their gameplay ideas into the first Dragon Quest. So naturally, some of these ideas made it into the second game. Dragon Quest 2 truly is the next logical step in JRPGs. If Dragon Quest is the progenitor, Dragon Quest 2 is the genre's first refinement. Hori and Nakamura were inspired to create Dragon Quest by Western computer RPGs, Wizardry, and Ultima. They wanted to feature multiple party members and more complicated battles than the first game, but weren't able to due to memory constraints. Dragon Quest 2 let them come closer to realizing that dream, but they had to ease the player into that concept. These features weren't feasible in the first game, but the dream became a reality in 2. But this also brought its own set of challenges. Balancing the difficulty of enemy encounters was a tough process for Hori, Nakamura, and the playtesters. Hori made himself extremely accessible during development, resulting in several delays, with staff able to directly communicate with him about specific complaints and concerns. Having multiple party members battling multiple monsters was apparently a massive programming challenge. It's something you wouldn't even think about would be an issue today, but at the time, it was an incredibly unique puzzle to solve. The result of all this playtesting is actually better realized in Dragon Quest 3 than Dragon Quest 2. In an interview translated by Shmopulations, Hori states that by the time the game came out, I wouldn't say we found the 100% ideal balance, but I think we came 90% of the way. If we had more time, I think we could have made it perfect. But I didn't want to make the children wait any longer. Gosh, that's so wholesome. Even lead programmer Nakamura admits that over the course of making Dragon Quest 2, no playtester played through the entire entire game all the way through. In fact, that's one of the biggest complaints about the original versions of Dragon Quest 2. The difficulty feels wildly unbalanced in the last third or so. Enemies can blast you with spells like Kamikaze or Thwack that can instantly kill the entire party, and certain mechanics like level progression were never ironed out to the place they needed to be. Players could pretty much only make it through the final few areas of the game by extensively over-grinding. Those that made it that far rarely did so out of joy, but rather with the grim determination that accompanies the sunk cost fallacy. For the first players ever trying to complete this game back in the 80s, it was probably kind of a nightmare. There are invisible items hidden in the overworld and in dungeons that require characters to be standing in the exact right spot to find them. What to do next to progress the story is often vague and unclear. The gameplay experience is pretty obtuse before several updates were added over the years. This game might not feature optional unlockable boss fights or hidden easter eggs, but it's plenty difficult on its own. There are a ton of game design things in JRPGs that we as players kind of take for granted these days. The Famicom and NES versions of Dragon Quest II deserve a lot of credit for showing developers what not to do in future JRPGs. One example, say your party is in a battle with multiple monsters. You set all members of your party to attack one enemy. Your first attack defeats that specific enemy, so the rest of your party attacks the other remaining monsters. Seems logical, right? The original versions of Dragon Quest lacked this feature, so party members could easily lose entire turns. It's just one example of an unbalanced feature that wasn't tweaked before the game was released, among many others. All this buildup leads me to the version of Dragon Quest 2 I completed for this episode. Yes, I completed the Nintendo Switch port because it's the most convenient way to play for completion purposes. Want to get over the differing aesthetics from the Japanese-only Super Famicom games, this is undeniably the most convenient, accessible, and dare I say, easiest version of the game that's around. Say what you will about how it looks, there are so many touches here that make everything easier. Even though Dragon Quest II has been ported to multiple systems since its 1987 release, received several graphical overhauls, and even massive gameplay tweaks, it still feels consistently like Dragon Quest. Thanks to the guiding hands of a few key figures, this game's influence remains strong to this day. Any discussion of Dragon Quest is incomplete without the Holy Trinity. Yuji Hori, scenario planner, Akira Toriyama, artist for the series, and Koichi Shugiyama, longtime Dragon Quest composer. The series has been iconic ever since 
since its inception, and even though the Switch port is less than ideal in some aesthetic aspects, it retains these core elements. Though it has its rough parts, the actual gameplay of this port is solid and a great representation of the older games in the series. The story of Dragon Quest II feels appropriately legendary. This game has a subtitle, Luminaries of the Legendary Line. The world of Dragon Quest shares some similarities to The Legend of Zelda in that there are features that reach across games, like slimes and spell names. There are always heroes in the Dragon Quest universe that will rise up to defeat evil, and those heroes tend to be tied to the hereditary line of Erdrick, a hero of old. In Dragon Quest II, the main party is composed of three of the descendants of the hero from the first Dragon Quest. 100 years after the hero defeated the Dragon Lord, a new threat has emerged. The Prince of Maidenhall, who I named Gerard, and his two cousins, the Prince of Canock and the Princess of Moonbrook, and they set out on a quest to defeat the evil wizard Hargon. Hargon wants to summon the demon Malroth, who is just bad news. He's bad. He's a, he's a bad guy. With, he's a demon lord. What other motivation do you need? He's, he's, he's f***ing evil. The call to adventure is strong from the start, thanks to Dragon Quest II's music. Now, this score is one of the game's defining features. Koichi Sugiyama is a composing legend, having created some of the best soundtracks from the NES era. Just listen to that overture from the NES version of Dragon Quest II, one of the most stirring and memorable pieces of video game music. Simply hearing that makes me want to go off on my own into the wilderness and battle slimes or fight a wizard or some the Switch port uses updated symphonic music, which is by no means bad. I loved what I listened to, though since I only completed the Switch version, wasn't really comparing the music to anything else. Toriyama's art has always been amazing to me, and that relationship was only fully embraced when I really completed Chrono Trigger not too long ago. It's lively and colorful, and all of the monsters and characters in this fantasy universe are bursting with personality. One of the reasons that the first few Dragon Quest games made such a strong impression is because the art style is extremely extremely distinct and specific. When designing characters for the original game, Toriyama would do full-on paintings of each and every creature, and then programmers would translate those paintings into pixel art. In the Switch port, monsters appear a little closer to Toriyama's original vision, since they are no longer translated into pixels. So the art direction of the Switch port is probably the most controversial thing about them. There's a disconnect here that isn't present in other versions of the games. The original is entirely 8-bit graphics, obviously from the overworld to the battle screens. The Super Famicom and Game Boy remakes are smoother and more colorful than the original. Clearly, a lot of love and care went into them. That isn't the case with the Switch port, which is essentially the same version that was ported to mobile devices a few years ago. The characters appear pixelated in the overworld and in towns, but upon entering a battle, the art style shifts completely with enemies and backgrounds taking on a painterly look. Outside of battles, the characters sort of stand out against the overworld. It doesn't look bad to me. The story is strong and the music is great, an absolute must for any JRPG. The art takes a little getting used to, but if you don't know what you're missing, I didn't find it that bad. In the same vein, if you watched the recent Dragon Quest 35th Anniversary Celebration or heard about the Dragon Quest 3 Remake and want to get into the series, this port is a great way to start. You might have done a little research like me and had noticed that Dragon Quest 2 is commonly referred to though as the hardest game in the franchise or is always ranked lower than other games in the series. But with some of the gameplay changes made for previous remakes and continued on with this port, I found this game perfectly enjoyable to complete. It's always hard for me to grapple with completing JRPGs for the completionist. Playing through these games generally takes forever, sometimes requires multiple playthroughs even. I am still suffering from last year's Persona 5 video. I'm always terrified about missing one small detail of a thing, right? Reaching max level and finding the best gear is always a grind, something that can take forever and sometimes completely destroy any kind of production schedule for me and my team if I'm not careful. That's actually one reason why I gave the first Dragon Quest a rating of complete it. There's nothing to grind here for, except for tackling the main story. These first two Dragon Quest games, even their Switch ports, don't have any big extras added to them. Just relax, explore, and grind. I found Dragon Quest 2 to be a genuinely pleasurable completion experience. Playing on modern consoles, with all the updates that have been grandfathered in over the years, this game went down pretty smoothly. It reminded me of what I enjoy about the genre on a base level, even with absolutely no nostalgia attached to this entire game.
When it comes to it, Dragon Quest II is a pretty bare-bones JRPG, but that's part of why I appreciate this port. It's streamlined. For diehard fans, this might not be the version they want to play. For people like me, on a time crunch and always operating under a minor layer of anxiety, it's easy breezy beautiful. A simple and relatively quick completion experience. For me, completing Dragon Quest II meant making it to the very end of the game with my party members at maximum level with the best equipment I could naturally find in the game. I didn't use any exploits to duplicate equipment, just good old fashioned money and finding chests in dungeons or drops from enemies. And of course, stumbling across the Thunder Sword best weapon in the game that is only found on the floor of a specific unmarked tile in a dungeon. Each of the three party members have meaningful differences. Now, this is nearly a full year before the first Final Fantasy released, which had totally different classes with specializations. It's impressive what Hori and Nakamura came up with here. The main hero, the man with the awesome goggles, is a strong, beefy warrior who can't cast spells. The Prince of Kanok, who I named Fasiani, is adept at mid-level spells and medium-strength attacks. He is the definition of just right. The Princess of Moonbrook, aka Bretta, is a powerful spellcaster who can heal and revive allies, as well as blast enemies with explosions. The game gradually ramps up in difficulty. My first task was filling out the party, which takes a surprisingly long time. Unlike the first Final Fantasy or other JRPGs where players would start with the full party at the time, Dragon Quest had me take Prince Gerard from place to place to find Fasiani, then rescue Princess Bretta. These party members are spread out across several different towns, and getting Bretta to join actually forced me to solve a complicated puzzle that I wasn't expecting. Bretta is stuck in the body of a dog, the ultimate indignity thanks to Hargon. I had to find a key item magical mirror and hold it up to her face to get her back to her human form and into my party. Traveling from town to town, fighting monsters in between, battling through the occasional dungeon, it all feels very familiar and satisfying. Stats increase at a pretty steady pace, and I'll never get tired of seeing a shiny new sword in town and grinding for enough money to purchase it. The repetitive nature of the JRPG is part of its charm, and Dragon Quest II has charm in spades. The part where Dragon Quest II really impressed me is soon after assembling the party. I had to fight my way to the town of Rippleport, where I heard through the grapevine I could acquire a ship. After rescuing an old man's granddaughter, I gained access to this new method of travel. This ship completely opens up the entire map, and this is the greatest strength and biggest weakness of the game. Up until this point, the plot was just about getting the crew together to battle Hargon, but with the ship, full exploration of the entire map suddenly becomes possible. The game tries to funnel players towards certain objectives, but if you're not paying attention, this open world structure can feel a little aimless. Remember, this is before quest logs or objective markers. But there is one place that fans of the series, especially those coming off of finishing the original game, will want to go to immediately. The continent of Tantangle, the map of the first game, site of the Dragon Lord's castle, and many fond memories of adventures, is just an ocean away from Rippleport. It's extremely cool to visit this area. I don't even have that strong of an attachment to the original Dragon Quest, but it's just awesome that the entire first map is entirely within its sequel. Yeah, it's a little scaled down to be sure, but the major locations are still there, and there's even a cool surprise in the form of a descendant of the Dragon Lord himself. After all, if the hero from the first game has descendants, why wouldn't the villain? Though this does raise the question about who the Dragon Lord was getting it on with. It was in Tantagle where I learned what the rest of the game would look like. Finding five magical charms hidden at different spots in the world and bringing them to a particular location to earn the Eye of Rubis. It sort of reminded me of finding the Triforce Shards in The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, though without having a treasure map to mark what I needed. Instead, the world was wide open to me. The execution isn't quite as epic as I would have hoped that it was, but it was still pretty cool. I had to return to the old standby of RPGs, talk to every random NPC I could find, in hopes that I would find a clue as to where to go next. The problem with this open world type of structure is tied to the random battles. Sailing around the oceans, I found battle after battle, but they don't really change in difficulty or complexity. Once I reached about level 20 or 25 and found some decent gear, Combat is essentially trivialized. Battles take about three turns max, just pressing the same few buttons over and over. The enemies still look great, and it still feels good to vanquish monsters, but it all feels a little flat. I have the ability to go anywhere, 
anywhere, and the game encourages me to do so. So battles don't feel like a test of skill in any way. This isn't really a complaint so much as a nitpick. I don't mind an easier to complete challenge, especially in regards to JRPGs, but in this case, the game didn't really test my skills so much as my patience by the end of it. I was always the first to give a game a fair shake at telling me what to do next, and I like to think that I'm pretty intuitive. But there is a lot of back and forth between areas you've been to before. I definitely had to resort to some type of old game facts guide to find out where to go next. At first, it's mysterious and cool to stumble across a town or a shrine where you don't know what you need to do yet. The towns all feel pretty distinct for their time, especially the underground city of Burrowell, or the island where the ruler forced my party to battle a bunch of monsters. Eventually, I found all the charms and the underwater temple of Rubis. With all the key items found, the final few areas were unlocked and the path to Hargon was clear. For me, these last few areas were just the right amount of difficulty and the perfect place to grind. I even had my party wipe a couple of times, but I never grew frustrated or annoyed, just took these defeats in stride as elements of an older JRPG. But reading through some old tips and tricks helped me realize how optimized my experience was overall. The last few dungeons in any JRPG should be a test of skill, strategy, and smart item management. That's certainly the case here, but the Switch port makes everything much easier than I could ever have imagined. It's almost frictionless, designed to propel players forward to the very end. Original versions of the game were extremely stingy with experience points and gold, forcing players to grind forever if they wanted to have a ghost of a chance against the monsters in the last few areas. The final dungeon is a boss gauntlet that is particularly brutal for the unprepared, but I was able to beat the final boss without as much grinding as I anticipated. Anticipated. Just to see if I could, and because there really isn't anything else to do in Dragon Quest 2, I tackled the final dungeon with the hero around 39 or 40. And you know what? I was able to move through the dungeon and beat the final boss with ease. I decided to grind every character to maximum level 50 just because and beat the game again. Turns out, this port makes that process way the heck easier in an attempt to balance out some flaws from the original version. But it feels like Square Enix overcorrected here. I'm not begging to be kicked to the curb or anything like that, but I'm not exaggerating when I say how surprised I am by how easy it was to reach level 50 for all three characters. Let me be clear, it is absolutely unnecessary to take every party member to 50. My stats were more than high enough to survive the end game the first time around. If you want to commit to the grind, I recommend the area just before the final dungeon. Soon after making it through the Cave of Rhone, there's a vast field with a tiny temple in the middle of it. The temple is a combination save point and inn, and players can fast travel to it whenever they'd like. This area is full of the strongest monsters and battles that give an average of 1,800 to 2,000 experience points per victory. Since the save point tells players how many more experience points they need to reach the next level, it's a matter of walking back and forth, performing hundreds of these battles in a row. Now I know there are high value liquid metal slimes in the Tower of Hargon, but it's just not worth it to try and defeat them when I can consistently earn EXP and be next to a save point where I can get a full heal if I felt like it. The lead up to the end is actually really memorable. After battling across the icy plains the final area, I stumbled across Hargon's tower. But instead of a sinister dungeon, I had walked into the starting town of Maidenhall. There were friendly NPCs, an inn, and even a little dog to welcome me home. But something was wrong. All of the characters talked about how amazing and benevolent Hargon is. Fortunately, I dispelled the illusion with the Eye of Rubis and saw through these lies. There are several powerful mini-bosses standing in the way of Hargon, but they were no match for my over-leveled party. Even Hargon himself didn't pose much of a threat, and after defeating him, it seemed like the party is all clear to go home. But there's one final fight to survive. Like any great JRPG, there's another boss fight, much more difficult than what came before it. The demon Malroth is strong and fast, but Gerard, Fasiani, and Breda prevailed. For a final fight, it's pretty epic and a fitting conclusion to our story. I love the end of this game. After defeating the evil Maroth, the world is safe, but instead of shoving players into a series of cutscenes or immediately rolling the credits, I was able to go back to any of the towns I had previously visited with no random battles on the way. It feels rapturous in a way. Going around the world and having NPCs tell you how cool and awesome you are rules. There's even a nice little Easter egg if you go and visit the Dragon Lord's descendant after defeating Hargon. 
He says that henceforth, he will call you the Dragon Warrior, which is what Dragon Quest was originally called when it came to the West. Now, to me, this is the only true real completion bonus here, though there is a tiny little reward for reaching level 50. If you go to a save point, normally a character tells you how many more points there are to go until you hit the next level. But at level 50, instead, I'm told that my characters are as strong as I can be. This was kind of an unexpected surprise, even if it's essentially just an in-game shout out. Finding Erdrick's armor and the powerful thunder sword on the floor of the cave to Roan is a necessary step rather than an optional one. There aren't any side quests to tie off in the post game or secret boss rushes that open up. And unlike future Dragon Quest titles, there aren't many games that award medals or anything like that. Defeat evil, roam the world receiving adulation, and see a fireworks show at the starting castle where epic music plays. Not a bad ending at all. And it took me less than 35 hours, including about three-ish hours of extra grinding to reach level 50. I don't know how many experience points I had total by the end of the game, as it stops counting after 1 million points for each character. That may sound like a lot, but it's nothing compared to the insanity I've experienced with other JRPGs. Apparently, Hori had a much darker ending in mind for the original game that never made it past the plan stage. Whereas the Prince of Maidenhall and the Princess of Moonbrook make it through the final battle, Hori wanted to have the Prince of Canock fall against Malroth. And that's not all. Once the player made it back to the starting town to pay respects to the king, Prince Canock's little sister was going to burst in and murder the hero for not adequately protecting her brother. Pretty dark stuff here. For this version of Dragon Quest 2 though, things wrap up pretty cleanly and nicely. Nothing too dark, just a straightforward adventure story. And that parallels the completion process. It was honestly a relief just to cruise through this game and enjoy the over-the-top dialogue, great art, beautiful music, and no frills JRPG gameplay from the franchise that started it all. I was a little worried about completing Dragon Quest 2 after I heard the horror stories about how unforgiving the game's back half can be. But I found it not nearly as tough as I anticipated, right? I think uh, that's where I come down with this game overall. Dragon Quest 2 is really good, and it's amazing to see how far the genre has come. If you want to experience where party management in JRPGs originated, or what an early open world game looks like, Dragon Quest 2 is it. I wouldn't hesitate to look up where to go next in certain situations, and you definitely don't need to grind to level 50 to make it through the very end. I, personally, dug this port a lot, but there's absolutely no reason to take the time to grind your levels out that way. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of, finish it. Finish it! <laughs>